Tonight's narrative is made possible by viewers like you and Hover.com, an easy way to find and register a domain name. Use promo code REACH to get 10% off. Let's talk about what's going on inside the GOP. So it's the question I have in mind around the GOP, it's not so much about who will be the minority leader in the Senate, because it will be one of them. But it's the question of who gets the speaker's gavel. Indeed, it seems like Kevin McCarthy could not get more than 188 votes today from his caucus, which is not very good. He needs at least 218, if I'm not mistaken. So he's in trouble a little bit because if he can get, if he just gets 188 votes when they vote on this in January, that's not going to cut it for him. He needs 218, which means either his lobbyists have to start bribing a lot more of these congressmen, or they have to find another sort of solution. And either it's going to come inside the GOP itself. And here's the interesting thing that keeps coming up here is that the speaker does not have to be elected from within the winning caucus in the house. So it doesn't have to come from within the GOP. It doesn't have to be within the Congress at all. It could just be anybody. So there's all sorts of people who could be the speaker of the house, including Kevin McCarthy, but Kevin can only get 188 votes. So he begs the question, who might they be thinking of? You know, some people, I thought at least one person has floated this woman, Liz Cheney. Interesting choice. That person is Steve Schmidt. The House Democrats and a handful of Republicans could make Liz Cheney the Speaker of the House. They should do it. He tweeted. So that's interesting. That's a remarkable suggestion. We're assuming that the GOP is going to win the House, and that's not decided yet, correct? Yes, but let's just see. It's all indications are that the GOP will just sneak in a win on the House. Now, if it may be that they don't. It may be that that's actually the Democrats win. There's still a path to victory for them. It's just not a very likely path to victory. Let's assume that, that it'll be a GOP House and that they will be a struggle to appoint a speaker because they will not be able to get 218 votes for anybody. In other words, the Democrats are going to be trying to kill any suggestions they have, whether it's Jim Jordan or McCarthy. And all they need is one or two figures from within the GOP to join the Democrats in a vote. And then whoever is trying to be speaker, their entire race gets tanked because of that. So it's a disaster for them, really. Even a slight victory in the House, even though they'll be celebrating, would be an absolutely disastrous place for any speaker to be or for the GOP to be. The Republicans are in a tight spot, first because of the treason and all the piles of felonies, but also because this is a race they should have won by a lot. I say should, you know, it was historically extremely rare to either lose as they did in the Senate or to come very close as they did in the House here on a year that's a midterm after a president takes over. But then again, you only do so many suicidally stupid things with women's health care every once in a while in the political landscape. So here we are. If you're the Republicans, what do you do? I think they should disband as a party, but that's my reaction to treason. If there are Republicans that decide they want to go down on a better side of history and the Democrats can work with Liz Cheney, like, you know, like everybody did during the January 6th committee or better, sure. Or to Kevin McCarthy or Jim Jordan as speaker, well, absolutely. Who wouldn't prefer that? And I think the Democrats could put up someone like Liz Cheney and they just need one or two votes from the Republicans and they would get Liz Cheney. So they just need one or two moderate votes. If they all voted in unity and why wouldn't they for this? I mean, they'd much rather have Liz Cheney, I assume, maybe not, who knows? I assume Liz Cheney's preferable to Kevin McCarthy, but if not her, somebody else. What about Adam Kinzinger there? He's yeah. actually elected. So if we're gonna go in that direction- Absolutely. I, uh... Adam Kinzinger could be the House Speaker, for sure. They could even put someone like a Barack Obama in there as the House Speaker, which is technically allowed and could actually lead to a third presidency if he was ever in line for that. There is a way for an American president to have a third term if he's appoint, elected by through the succession line into is the House Speaker. I looked it up. Wow. I swear it's true. Okay. Um, All right. You're on, you got on Wikipedia for this one. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you could, we could debate it if you want, but that's just the case, I think. So I have um, some extra time in my calendar. If they need me to be speaker, <laughs> I'll do it. Why don't you be speaker? You'd be a great speaker. I think it'd be fantastic, certainly better than Kevin McCarthy. Meanwhile, over the Senate, this guy, just the smarmiest guy in the entire world, is trying to depose the other smarmy guy, McConnell, from being the House Minority Leader. He's apparently mounting some sort of challenge because he's just a, not a very The nice Medicare person. Fraud Caucus? Yeah, it's the Medicare Fraud that I'm worried about. Yeah, it's not a very good uh, look for Mr. Rick Scott here. Anyhow, that's going to be happening in the Senate. And I guess there's concern around McConnell's valid concerns around his ties to China because his wife is Elaine Chao, who's connected to a famous Chinese family of organized crime and uh, other reputation. I shouldn't say organized crime. I should say um, 
Is it, is it close? Well, it's hard to tell sometimes over there because they're so close to the not to the in the shipping world. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's true. I mean, shipping is shipping. You know, shipping is shipping. Shipping, trucking companies, the bada bing, taxis, bada bing. You know. I hear you. So, do I expect McConnell is going to be the next Senate Minority Can Leader? Can you take his photo down? That is getting re really just creepy. Isn't it I'd, creepy? <laughs> no, I'd rather look at Mitch, and I've never said that before. <laughs> ah. <laughs> do you see what Thank Josh? Thank you, God. That got the show just got easier. For the rest I know. Of the folks. All those pictures are difficult to look at. Josh Hawley today said he thought the GOP is now dead. He said the old GOP is now. Oh, a... my, my favorite. He blames Washington GOP. Like. He yep. doesn't have a house in Missouri. He <laughs> lives in North. He lives in D.C. Now he does not. He has a house in both districts. He doesn't have a house in Missouri. Does he have no address in he, Missouri? It's illegal. He should not even be allowed to serve. But then this is a guy who argued before the Supreme Court without taking the Supreme Court bar. The rules don't apply. We don't bother with trifling laws here in Missouri. Let me tell apparently, you. Apparently, apparently not. No, Josh lives in Vienna, Virginia. I know where he lives. Oh, do and, you? and I know he doesn't live. So I live in Missouri and he lives near my colleagues. Yeah. He's Senator, yeah. but he's like, oh, it's Washington GOP. It's the Washington Republicans as if there's any other kind for him. He got into a little bit of trouble, didn't he? Yes. Tell us a little bit about what so, this is about. So there was a judgment in Cole County, which is the county that includes Jefferson City, Missouri, which is the capital of Missouri. So anything that's coming down about the state government goes to Cole County courts. This is the Honorable Judge Beatum. And he found in favor of the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee, who is suing the Office of the Missouri Attorney General for having obscured records of Hawley having used Missouri state government resources in his campaign for Senate, which is illegal. He had just been elected Attorney General in late 2016, his biggest donor being Peter Thiel, who gave $300,000 to his campaign. There were two big California donors in 2016, $1 million to Eric Greitens for governor from a guy named Michael Gogan, who is a partner at Sequoia, which is basically a big Chinese money funnel in mm -hmm. California. Mm -hmm. And then Peter Thiel gave 300,000 so Josh Aru could be Attorney General. And he no sooner did he get elected that his senatorial campaign staff, which apparently existed as early as January 2017, just immediately started working with the state offices, which is a misuse of Missouri taxpayer dollars to help Josh run for Senate when he hadn't even done his other job poorly yet. And apparently they so, use their conducting business through private email accounts, which sounds so similar to the Hillary Clinton campaign they've had such a problem with. But anyhow. Oh, um, it's way yeah. worse in Missouri, yeah, and especially yeah. with the Missouri courts, because you had Hawley, you had Greitens, and you had all that crew were using app applications like Confide and other private, you know, like message destroying applications that the courts around here said it's not officially destroying government records because those government records never existed, even though it was government people doing government business over these digital devices, because the evidence was destroyed, it was never evidence, so that's not destruction of evidence. Wow. Let me read from it's, this. It says, further the fact that, that this public business was conducted through and stored in private email accounts in direct contravention of the AGO's official policies, prohibiting AGO employees from conducting public business on private emails is itself evidence of a conscious design, intent, or plan to conceal these potentially controversial records from public view. So yep, Josh has been a bad this, boy. This is a reversal of what I was just telling you, what the courts have found generally, which is like, it's, oh, I mean, look, this is a place where record buildings catch on fire. Yeah, yes. Where 10 tons of records from the animal control center will catch on fire. And the county of St. Louis said it was because they were infested with cockroaches, cockroaches when they'd really just gotten a subpoena from a federal court, murdering animals in a brutal way. It's just a very interesting state, but that's the lay of the land here. And the courts were even upholding the Missouri GOP using digital applications that would destroy, as in, you know, we'll let whatever foreign powers monitor our communications, but you, the voter, and you, the courts, you don't get a look. And they even had blessed that and said, oh, well, that just means the record never existed, so it's technically not destroying it, which is surreal to make Salvador Dali weep. But here, what's special today is you have a judge in Cole County who's like, actually, hiding stuff is bad, and hiding records is bad, and that's a first here.
That's, that is good that they've reached that that final conclusion there. The court acknowledges that this is the maximum penalty that may be imposed for knowing and purposeful violation of the Sunshine Law and finds it be appropriate given position of the offending parties, the Office of the Attorney General and its custodian of records and its role in both educating and enforcing the Sunshine Law. So they're also saying these guys were meant to be the enforcers of the Sunshine Law. And then on top of that, they broke it themselves. They're lovely. violators. That's right. I, that's lovely and... stuff. Well done, Josh. Yeah, and incidentally, it's the same attorney on, I believe, on this lawsuit, as well as the Confide lawsuit, as well as the St. Louis County Animal Control lawsuit, Mark Pedroli, who helped with Elad Gross, helped bust Eric Schmidt's involvement with the Republican Attorney General's Association in assembling the attackers on January 6th. Wow. And so basically, when Mark Pedroli comes to town, records generally catch on fire. Yeah, so, spontaneously. <laughs> just, spontaneously. By, just by him arriving there. Yeah. What a place you live. So let's talk a little bit about the breakthrough in Bali. I was very bullish on this when I was talking about how amazing it is that Joe Biden was able to walk into this meeting with Xi, which should have been incredibly confrontational, but landed up being really conciliatory. Look at all those nice smiles everywhere. They promised not to attack Taiwan. They promised to work on all their outstanding issues together. It was a very, very nice conciliatory meeting. They're not going to have a cold war. There's enough room for everybody on this planet. Lots of competition yeah. is good. That's basically what they all agreed to with the, you know, the Chinese and the American side. Now, obviously there was something else in the subtext there that we were not getting because when what was the line that Biden used, he used, I want to make sure that she knows that I say what I mean and I mean what I say, which is the same thing he told Putin after that meeting. He had a face-to-face -face meeting, which landed up rearranging the entire planet. So I think what we just saw is maybe another one of those meetings that rearranged the entire planet. And we just don't know quite how it works. On the way into his Bali meeting, he was able to meet with South Korea and Japan and solidify relationships there. And certainly he's coming with a, quite a coalition around his ACO partners that are putting Xi in a bit of a box. Plus, Xi's got a lot of problems that maybe Biden figures he could help Xi with. Things like a starving population, a COVID explosion, a mortgage crisis, the failure of belt and loop things. Those are all a challenge for Xi right now as he starts his third term. So maybe behind the scenes, Biden might be offering some carrots there as well. Who knows? Hi there, it's Zev from Narrative. Have you ever had a great business idea, but just didn't know where to start? Well, one of the first steps to building a new business is a domain name by Hover. That's because it's more important than ever to have an online presence and your domain name by Hover is your first step in building your online brand. Hover.com makes it quick and easy to find the perfect domain name for your business with over 400 available extensions. And with their connect feature, you can easily connect your Hover domain name to many popular website builders with just a few clicks. Plus, Hover offers free who is privacy, that's free who is privacy, that protects your personal information from being released online. Don't let the complicated search, sign up and connection process of other domain providers stop you from starting your online brand today. Hover makes it easy to get started, so what are you waiting for? Find your perfect domain name at hover.com forward slash reach. Plus, Narrative Live viewers get 10% off right now. If you use the promo code REACH, that's R-E-A-C-H, or go to hover.com forward slash reach. We seem to have scared off the dragon. That to me is what I, the takeaway from all of this is like, if you remember that first meeting between Blinken and his counterparts at the start of the Biden administration, it went horrifically. The Chinese senior diplomat there was very critical of the United States, launching accusation after accusation. Oh, yeah. was, I mean, oh, yeah. within a very short amount of time, we've gone from that to smiles and handshakes and, and niceties and no cold wars and let's have friendly competition. That's quite a, an achievement by an incredible president who's obviously the key to this foreign policy brilliance that they've been doing. But I'm going to be digging around because I'm really interested in what might be under the surface here as to what they got on Xi to make him so agreeable. I mean, we've locked them out of semiconductors for the future. They've depended on us. This is the problem with their strategic plan here of destroying America. You come at the king, you best not miss. Yeah. They missed and everybody saw him shoot. And they kept that under wraps a long time. Yeah. And uh, they got exposed for it. And so now they have to explain their position to the world on that. And meanwhile, it's like, we don't need them. We don't need their intellectual property. They don't create any. We don't need their exports. They're exporting stuff that we're telling them how to make. 
We can make that stuff here. Look at this map. It's a really telling map about how the world's most important trading partner status has shifted from America to China in 20 years. 20 years is a long time, but the countries that identified, now they obviously all still trade with both countries, but it sure looks like we've allowed China to basically become the main trading partner of a lot of these countries around the world. And that's clearly not going to be the case going forward. This attack on democracy that Xi spearheaded is going to cause a reaction that sees them returning down to a very manageable size. It's great to see these two maps. I remember back in 2000, I've talked on this show before about trying to talk to executives about what we call Chinese math. They're like, oh, we got to get into China. If we only get 1% of their market, but it's going to be great. And when you'd ask the question, well, what do you think they want back in return? They're like, what do you mean? This is American executives. Well, they had ambitions and they had a strategic plan. There's a country that's been around multiple thousand years and American executives didn't listen and American tech companies didn't listen and went and started doing deals with China to help them build the, the golden shield system to surveil their own citizens. And our financial largesse from the year 2000 financed the map on the right there. Mm -hmm. Oh we, yeah. It's we, an American made we, map. I think that's that an American. Yes. It, we gave them hard cash. You could buy petroleum in. We gave them, you know, we helped finance that map on the right. And uh, we're lucky we caught this when we did. And there's a whole lot of people in Missouri and elsewhere who got all the way in bed with China. They thought if they could just make that money up front and they would get a better position in the new world order. Well, it's not new and it ain't order. There's two other things I want to bring up. And one of them is a subject that I've really wanted to raise a few weeks now. We haven't had a chance to focus on it. But what's going on in Iran right now is beginning to reach the level of human rights violations and uh, terrorism of its own population in a way that you just can't fathom, nor should the world be accepting. When you speak about Iran, you're obviously talking about Russia's partners. You're also talking about China's partners. So they're part of that alliance, as we've been talking tonight about these those two countries. I'm going to show you some very disturbing video that was taken from the metro station in Tehran, it's very disturbing because it shows this is people, protesters on the platform of a, of their subway in Tehran and then being open fire. <laughs> I mean, that's, I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like that, but it's, you know, these are protesters in exercising what we here in the United States would consider a freedom that we could express. And there's been three months now of protests in the, in Iran that have gone on and the death toll has gotten progressively worse from day to day. And I think we need to be paying a lot more attention to it. So there are now 52 children that have been killed during these protests, an enormous number of protesters in total that have been killed 341. And the New York Times just published this really brilliant and sad poster of the 50 miners that have been killed in Iranian protests since this started in three months ago. The story that really has not received a lot of attention here in the United States, but it deserves some attention because it's getting more and more serious over time. The Iranians are getting more brutal over time, and it doesn't seem like the protesters are in any mood to give up. In all the video that I follow online, there's still a lot of active protests on a daily basis around the country in many, many locations. I think it's like 140 different cities that have now taken part in the protests. We've said it before about the Iranians, this could be the undoing of the Iranian regime, but who knows? But it certainly is a, quite a vast attempt to shut down a very a big and broad protest in Iran, and it needs to be paid some attention. I'm just raising it here so others can also raise attention on wherever they might be creating content. You know, the, the regime hasn't been in place for 40 plus years now, and it uh, doesn't really have any place in the international order. And hopefully we can support their democracy movement and uh, replace it with a real regime that represents their people. There's a lot of folks there that deserve peace after so much strife for the last hundred years. When you think back about the Iran of the Shah's days, so much has changed for what was once the most really incredibly enlightened country with incredibly enlightened people. You mean during the Shah period? Yeah. Well, it was enlightened except for the Savak secret police.
So as long as you weren't being tortured, you had license to be enlightened. By the way, do you know who sold the IT to the Savak in the 1970s? No, tell me about, tell me about that. Ross Perot, who was the third party spoiler candidate in 1992 that allowed Bill Clinton to win the presidency with 43% of the popular vote. The people who are involved in Iran never cease to amaze me. The people that land up actually being involved, you imagine they would never be involved. And they, there they are. They just, they keep popping up. I'm glad you bring it up. It's an incredibly important country. You and I, in, in our work, as we go public with some stuff about Jeffrey Epstein and Robert Maxwell, a lot of this comes back to the Iran Contra period. Now, they've been sitting on the second largest or first largest untapped, easy to get to petroleum reserves in the world. So sanctioning that oil has been of huge geopolitical consequence for four plus decades. Plus it's been geopolitically important for millennia, but definitely the last century. So, I mean, it's one of the secret histories out there of something that Bill Barr knows about, something that Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton know about, something that the Bushes knew about and Meanwhile, there's, I think, what, 60, 80 million Iranians, 51% of them Persian, the rest a kaleidoscope of different ethnic groups. And uh, it's one of the world's most interesting countries. And hopefully we can bring those people back into the world order and not through a regime like the Shahs, but uh, one that is more representative of the democracy that America wants to shine out to the rest of the world. First, we have to have it at home here. Yeah. But hopefully we can get there too. We're working on that. Speaking of the democracy that we haven't had, you know, just because it's really funny, here's Mike Liddell losing it because he is, he's, he's like a wind up doll. So I thought we'd, we'll leave on this note. They are caught and this is going to just, the tip of the spear for unraveling. See, there's tens and tens of thousands of citizens that are looking for a place to reach out. They're going to do sworn affidavits of what happened. I don't think there's a judge in this country that can't say we need a new election down there in Arizona. And not just for Kerry Lake. Remember, they took Mark Fincham's too. They took Blake Masters. They were all stolen. And I don't care. Doesn't matter what anyone says. We already know. This. We were watching it from the Edison report. We were watching it cyberly, and and we were watching just blatantly. The citizens were all watching. So you have imagine having three different camera angles of a crime. When you have a crime of this magnitude committed, you can't certify this election. We caught them. They're out. Oh my gosh. I'm only four gesticulations away from winning Arizona. Oh my gosh. It's the same lines. He's exactly the same lines. He's been using ever since he started his little trip down uh, voter fraud land. He's still using the same language, the same stuff. And yeah, America, that I is your GOP. Like. I wonder what it's like to be these guys who should have been arrested a long time ago. And they know it. And they just feel the walls closing in. I mean, I don't have to worry because, see, I've never sold my country out. I don't sell toddlers to other people. I don't uh, traffic fentanyl and then bribe city officials with it. I don't have I like these problems. So I just wonder what it feels like to know that there is no escape this time. That's a good question. We'll leave you on that note. So thanks for being here on Narrative. You can always support us at patreon.com forward slash narrative. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. And don't forget our sponsors tonight were hover.com and at hover.com forward slash reach is where you can get 10% off your next domain name. Every minute of Narrative's reporting, every story that we break is made possible by our patrons. You too can become a patron by joining at patreon.com forward slash Narrative. Narrative. Where truth lives. One day, you'll tell the story of autocrats, crooks, and kings who came for our freedom. A story of citizens who stood up to tyranny and won. The people prevailed and renewed an old vow to a more perfect union. And that was just the beginning. The story continues. narrative where truth lives.